Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And this is the third video uh, in a series where I'm discussing uh, methane in the Arctic. Um, so this is the AMAP report, AMAP Assessment 2015. Hopefully they update this. This is the most recent one that I could find. And it's got all of the nitty gritty details about methane in the Arctic, how it moves, how it, where it's produced, how it gets there, how it's affecting climate, etc. Um, and, um, you know, how it's forcing the climate, how it's contributing to Arctic temperature amplification. So if you just go to AMAP, Google AMAP, and you can just download the PDF file and follow, follow it as you, as you uh, and, and, and from my videos, hopefully I can help you, you know, help explain some of the key things that are in this report. So I'll go to the report here. Um, this is an ecologist sampling methane on an Arctic lake. Okay, catching the bubbles that are coming up. So I'll continue on um, where, to where I left off previously, um, which is, uh, here we go. Okay, so chapter two, the global methane budget and the role of methane in climate forcing. Okay, there's a whole bunch of sources and uh, not so many sinks. Um, but it's mostly chemical reactions that remove methane from the atmosphere. The lifetime of methane is about nine years. It's well mixed in the troposphere, which is lower atmosphere, and a global budget can be constructed as, so this is the change in me the methane, delta B CH4 is a change in the global amount of methane in the atmosphere. EM is the global total emissions, and L is the global total of methane losses. So think of a bathtub. Okay, this would be the level of water in the bathtub. This would be water coming in from the taps. This would be water going out the drain. So, so if you increase the taps, the sources, then the water level goes up. If you decrease, if you, uh, decrease the losses, the level goes up. If you increase the losses, so make a bigger drain, um, then the level of water goes down. So it's just a, it's just a balance here. So basically, um, the amount of the changes we can measure accurately, and the losses we can measure fairly are fairly tightly constrained, fairly accurately. So then we can get the total emission sources, um, and they're constrained to roughly ten percent accuracy. But the division among the components, the anthropogenic, the natural, et cetera, those are, uh, those are more difficult and there's considerable research done on those. Okay, so this chat, so here we'll look at the, how do we, re how is methane removed from the atmosphere? Okay, uh, the stability, magnitude of the sink and the mechanisms that affect it. Okay, so first of all, there's three different Stop. The dominant sources of methane, there's three categories, biogenic, thermogenic, and pyrogenic. So biogenic methane is produced by microorganisms during the decomposition of organic carbon in anaerobic, low oxygen environments. Okay, so that's like wetlands, flooded rice fields, landfills, termites, the guts of ruminant animals like cows. Okay, most of the methane from cows is coming out of its mouth from burping, not from its other extremity, as people generally think. Some comes from the other extremity, but most is from the, uh, it comes out through the chewing and the gas is released from the mouth. Thermogenic methane, heat, thermo, is produced on geological time scales. Okay, when deposits of organic material are exposed to high heat and high pressure, you get fossil fuels forming when the pressure is released. For example, when we, if it's vented or leaked, then, or when we extract natural gas, oil, and coal, when we mine the stuff, we bring it to the surface, pressure is lower, methane is released. Um, natural gas, fracking, okay, um, it, it may also enter the, um, atmosphere through naturally occurring pathways like seeps, volcanic seeps or non-volcanic seeps, and uh, mud volcanoes. Okay, now pyro. Pyro is fire. Pyrogenic methane is, the is from the 
produced from the incomplete combustion of organic material. So that's like biofuel burning, agricultural fires, wildfires, okay? It's mostly CO2 that's produced, but methane is also coming out. Remember that the methane scales are generally on the part per billion level, CO2 is on the part per million. There's another category called abiotic methane, and there's chemical reactions in the Earth's crust, inorganic carbon, which is in rocks and things, is involved, and that can re re release some methane. It, the, the magnitude is poorly known, but it's not believed to be significant. At least its changes are not believed to be significant. Okay, um, it's geological processes, um, and we're not um, certainly not not changing them significantly. I mean, we're doing lots of mining, we're fracking, we're injecting things into the ground, so there might be some changes. Okay, so the other key thing is we have to classify methane as either natural or anthropogenic. So anthropogenic, and this is directly, so anthropogenic is human caused, human released, um, versus natural. Now, humans are changing the natural emissions, right? By warm, changing the temperature, by changing the hydrology, we're changing the natural emissions. So there's a big anthropogenic component also in natural. Now these are the average estimated annual average emissions for the major methane sources from 2000 to 2009. Okay, so he, we've got natural sources here, and we've got anthropogenic sources here. The total of natural, 349, the units are teragrams. Okay, teragrams are like gigatons. Okay, giga is 10 to the 9th. A ton is 1,000 kilograms. Okay, so you add 10, you multiply by 10 to the cube for the 1,000, and 10 to the cube for kilograms to grams. So you get 10 to the 15 grams, okay? Uh, which is, so gigaton teragram. So 349 uh, natural and anthropogenic, 331. So comparable. The natural and anthropogenic emissions are comparable. But remember, there's a not, there's a, if we're changing, if we're, if, if our activity on the planet, we're changing wetlands, we're changing all of these things, Right, wildfires are going up because of climate change. Uh, hydrology is changing, can change, uh, adding more and more wetlands in, in northern regions as, as it's warming. Um, we're reducing the, you know, we're in, we have huge amounts of livestock, for example, cows that produce uh, uh, methane, etc. So we're affecting all of these natural sources as well, although they're not directly. Um, human, they're, 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 they're separated from the anthropogenic. So wetlands, huge component, okay? The biggest component by far, uh, followed by geological emissions, so seeps and things, fresh water, lakes and rivers, okay? Methane coming up from the, the, um, the, the, uh, the bottom of, of lakes and uh, rivers, the riverbeds. Um, wild animals next at 15, termites is a big factor, surprisingly big factor, um, marine, um, and uh, permafrost is listed as very small here. Uh, wildfires, three, it's growing, these are the ranges, okay, for a total of 349, okay, with this variance here, 238 to 492. Teragrams. This is the annual average emission in teragrams of methane. Now for anthropogenic, okay, so the biggest here is fossil fuels, of course, 96. But very close is domesticated animals, so livestock. This is why if we all switch to be vegetarians, we would have it, there'd be a huge reduction of methane, um, of, 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 uh, of, of emissions. Um, landfills and waste pretty high up there, and then rice cultivation and biomass burning are also very high, uh, they're comparable, 35, 36. So the total of anthropogenic and the total of uh, natural are roughly comparable. Okay, this is methane in the air in parts per billion. Okay, so there is a seasonal variation, this is the, that's smoothed out here. And this is the global 
So this is the global average. And what you can see is there is fluctuation. It was increasing here um, to 2000. You know, it was pretty flat here. And in 2007, it started upticking, but the rate of rise here is not yet the same as the rate of rise here. It's a bit slower here. This is the, if you take the derivative of this curve, basically, so take the derivative of the smooth curve, you're looking at the rate of change or the slope of this curve. So this is the, the instantaneous slope of this curve is plotted here. So you can see the emissions were, you know, very, very high in, uh, so this is 85 to the, 90s peaking here at about 15 in the early 90s then we had the collapse of communism um, and uh, there was a large volcano around this time the emissions dropped below zero here in the in sort of the early 90s and then they uh, you know there wasn't much change here okay it flattened out and look at the, this negative emissions in 2004 i'm not sure what's going on there this is a strong el nino here uh, much much warmer oceans so the oceans could hold less methane more in the atmosphere again a peak of about 15. um and then um and then what happened is you know about 2007 here the methane uh levels are, are higher so the the their the emissions here are about something like six, uh, the, the change, the increase of CO2, of meth, methane concentration in the atmosphere in parts per billion, the growth in parts per billion per year is about the six ppb per year sort of level. So there, there's where we have, so that's what we're seeing. And uh, you can read the details to get more information. This is the global, um, this is how the methane is, this is a latitudinal distribution of methane uh, in the 2000s, up to 2014. Um, so this is actually the equator, 30 and, and 90. Now notice the spacing here, the 0 to 30, 30 to 90, it's an equal spacing. This is plotted as the sign of the latitude. The reason being is that 50% of the surface area of the Earth occurs between 30 degree north and 30 degrees south 50 percent so the other so in other words half and the other part of the area is half okay so this just is a, is a way of displaying it and what you can see is this is the increase of methane in parts per billion per year okay so what you can see is you can see very very high emissions here over 20 ppb per year rise up in the arctic up in the arctic regions or, or at least the northern hemisphere regions, um, and what you could, but what you can see is a trend here as you come here. You're moving from the blues are a drop actually, so some year is dropping, and the greens and up are increases. So you can see a lot more blue here as you go here. You're seeing mostly green, yellow, and red. So the emissions are, and this is uh, about the 2007. Okay, so the emissions globally, there's a lot more methane in the atmosphere, and it's increasing globally here, and you can see hot spots up in the Arctic. You know, this was a very bad series of years here. Um, strong, uh, okay, I think there was an El Nino around then to, there too. Um, and then you can see a lot, lot, look at the drop here in near the equator. Um, in this particular year, and then an increase over here. So you can see what's going on sort of on a global basis from this. Now, the dominant removal process for methane is by chemical reactions with OH. So OH, which is a negative charge, reacts with the methane molecule. It produces water and this methyl radical, CH3 dot, uh, uh, which re reacts very rapidly within seconds with an oxygen molecule to produce methyl peroxyl. So what you see is when this reaction occurs in the stratosphere, it produces, it results in water in the stratosphere and it gives these noctilucent clouds that you can see. Okay, now the, uh, the lifetime of methane is against the initial reaction with OH is 11.2 years, but then there's other reactions which bring it down to nine. Anyway, I'll continue. Thank you.